Baby boomers. I used to be with it. Millennials. Okay, boomer. Generation X. What's going on? And Gen Z. <laughs> what do they have in common? Not a lot, it turns out. But one thing they can agree on is that this is the political podcast they want to listen to. Welcome to Not My Generation, the political podcast that looks at political events, news and happenings across the world and at home through a generational lens. Your hosts are Dr. Emily Stacy and Professor James Davenport, two political scientists from Rose State College. But the views expressed on this program are solely the views of the host and their guests and do not reflect the views of Rose State College, its administration, faculty, or students. Coming up on today's program. Yay, we love that. Enjoy it while you can. <laughs> I take her at her word. She's a feisty lady. I just found that whole episode absurd. And now, here are James and Emily. Good morning, Emily. Better. That's much better. I appreciate the the docile tones. The, the first take was a, just a little bit too uh, abrupt for me, I think. Cool, and you're not excited? It's a beautiful day. I am the excited. The weather's getting warm. It is. Uh, the sun I mean, is out. Look, know? look, sir, I'm going to have to, I, we know what this is. This is. It's a teaser. It's pretend yes, spring, right? Right, exactly. We, we go through these random motions That's in the exactly state of Oklahoma. That's exactly what it is. So, you know. Um, but 80 in February, we're going to pay for this. It, enjoy it while you can. <laughs> like we're, we, we will pay for this eventually. Some way. But yes, I am uh, very excited. Hopefully yeah. we'll do maybe a picnic this weekend, as I mentioned. Ooh, and, that'll be fun. You know, yeah. some some family fun outside. We need some yeah. some I've sun got, a little bit. So, yeah. Uh, I've got a, uh, a son coming back from South Carolina. Hmm, I wonder what he's yeah. doing there. Uh, mm. South Carolina, Saturday night. So yeah. I'll get to have a lowdown about all of that. I wonder uh, if he's coming back a winner. Probably not. Probably but, not. You know, but it's okay. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it's interesting. Um, um, Haley, Nikki Haley has said, doesn't matter. She's the result. not. She's yeah, not back. In. She's not at all. I wonder even. how sincere that is. Oh, I think it's. I think it's sincere. She's I'm got the getting, money behind well, her. And Why I'm not? Getting, I'm getting the feeling that she's. Start, this is getting a little personal, personal. for her. Yeah, I agree. It's like, okay, yeah, if you're going to come at me like this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to drag this out yeah. as long as I freaking can. I mean, right. And right? she's got, what, Coke Brother money behind her. And uh, so why yeah. not? Why, why not? not just dwindle the, the coffers at this point? And I think a lot of people, probably including some in the Republican Party, are still kind of holding out hope that somebody's going to run third party, even though Joe Manchin sort of dashed some hopes this right. week with, with his I announcement said, that he yeah. wouldn't. Including my hopes, um, so yeah, we'll we'll see. But I don't. Uh, I I I take her at her word. She's a feisty lady. Uh, she she doesn't back down. She does not. Right? And, yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, draining coffers, if Trump gets a couple more judgments like he got. Uh, Earlier this week, he's he, he's not going to have a whole lot of money to run on. Well, yeah, interestingly enough, you got a, a bit of a soundbite from uh, potentially a, the co-chair of the Republican National Committee, uh, his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, uh, who kind of intimated that perhaps the party wouldn't be against uh, helping pay for some of those legal fees. So um, I'll, I, I don't know what the rank and file think uh, uh, about that, but I'm just wondering what the legality of that is. Yeah. Right? Can you take money designated for party activities right. and such right. and just say, we're going to fund the legal bills of Personally. a candidate? Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I would assume the the FEC gets involved. At I, some uh, that point, would be right? that would be interesting. Well, what's <laughs> happening on the uh, the international level? Let's talk about that for a minute. So, a couple of different things going on, and then twenty five actually elections that we should be watching um, in in terms of the global order and kind of the the changing the shifting tide uh, of of influence and power within the international community. Um, I think first, uh, in, in terms of Israel, um, there has been kind of a shifting tone mm -hmm. um, more recently, and specifically within the administration, Biden and uh, Secretary of State Blinken, um, taking more of a decisive, um, you know, tone in terms of um, not 
just kind of co-signing what's going on or what what Israel, uh, the amount of force, right, is, is kind of what has been uh, discussed specifically over the past week and a half um, after Israel specifically targeted Rafa, um, that refugee mm-hmm. camp, right? That was, I mean, those were tents, right? We're, t- we're talking, not talking about buildings or infrastructure um, at that point. We're talking about a, a designated refugee camp. And so uh, I think within the international community, uh, it, it gets kind of difficult to just kind of blanketly co-sign mm-hmm. um, what Netanyahu is is doing. Um, you know, and again, we, we continue to make the point that, yes, Israel has the right to defend itself, and so does every sovereign, right, sure. nation. Um, but again, Gaza and the Gazans are not... Hamas, right? right. Um, and, and so this is this is kind of where we are uh, w- within this fight. So you've had uh, strikes uh, over the course of the last week and a half that have really raised questions, and lots of people, including uh, children, uh, have a couple died. of things that, yeah. that that I've noticed on on that front. One, uh, it hasn't slowed from my my um, observations. It haven't slowed Biden's efforts to get funding Not for at all. Israel. Not right, at all. To, no. uh, so we haven't seen it move him to that extent Not at to say, all. hey. No, no, no. Uh, but the other thing is what we all know uh, Netanyahu's trying to do is save his job. Right. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, I think uh, from what I hear from people uh, in Israel talking about is uh, there is growing and mounting dissatisfaction oh, yeah. with the, and the perspective that it was a direct failure of his yes, yeah. administration that allowed this to occur in the first place. Yeah, I think that is an interesting point. And I was actually talking uh, to my comparative politics class uh, about this very point, right? Um, you know, this is an op- opportunistic moment for Netanyahu, right? War is always for a strong man, uh, a way to sort of legitimize power, right? We can't switch horses midstream, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, you, you can't switch in the middle of war. Uh and what I think a lot of the American people probably don't remember in recent history is that he was actually out of office for a little bit, right? Uh, disgraced is still under uh, indictment for a number of charges, including corruption, right? He tried to fold the judiciary under the right. executive branch right. most recently. Uh, and so uh, I think a lot of that is lost uh, on the American public, uh, but it's certainly not lost on those discontent Israelis, That's right? right. Um, so he's just barely, my point uh, is he's just barely holding a government together, right? It, it was exactly. only because the opposition it couldn't hold a coalition government together, and he was kind of the one that could. Um, and and he, his, his party uh, had to actually make some alliances with some more yes. farther Extreme. right, yes. right yes. Uh, parties to get that coalition. Yes, right. uh, and there is now, you know, I've heard some speculation that when, for those who don't know, in the parliamentary system, when you do that, one of the things that that the, whoever is the lead party is going to have to do is offer up some uh, administration posts to mm-hmm. those other those mm-hmm. other parties to keep your coalition. Yep. And there's been some speculation that those folks were not very competent in what they were doing. And yeah. that had a direct bearing on this whole this, attack. Yeah, that's exactly right? it. Yeah. Yeah, the the defense minister uh, or secretary, I can't remember which which one they use, but uh, that person has definitely been under fire um, over uh, incompetence sure. and, and perhaps having uh, a, an inflated plan of attack. So uh, we're definitely not anywhere near the end of this, unfortunately, right? This is... Mm-hmm. This is, uh, well, you know, bygones. Uh, so that's the first one. And let me depress you just a little bit more. Uh-oh. And just a little bit more um, because we're actually coming up on the uh, second anniversary um, of the invasion of Ukraine. That um, is correct. And so this is a time, I hope, for people to uh, start to think about what's gone on uh, and maybe pivot in strategy. Uh, of course, we just had the Munich uh, Security Conference. So you had uh, world leaders meet, including Zelensky. Um, and he noted um, that for every one year, Ukrainian soldier dead. Um, I'm sorry, there's one uh, Ukrainian soldier dead for every five Russians. Wow. Um, so they are now thinking about conscripting, right? Expanding the draft um, in order to just keep up the, the, the uh, you know, defense right. um, th- that they are um, kind of just tentatively holding together at this point. Um, at at uh, some point, don't you have to wonder how long 
Putin can drag this out. I mean, that's yeah. cost. It's oh, yeah. cost in in human lives yep. for Russian sure. human lives. Yeah. It's cost in materials and equipment, all of that, right? How, to what extent, uh, and, and what would victory look like for them? I, I just wonder how long he can maintain that. Now, clearly, he's got a firm hold on the government in Russia. Yeah. So it's not like he's in, in necessarily in danger right now of right. somebody um, uh, mounting a challenge to him. And he did just... I don't. The suspicion is that he just speculation removed a a a political opponent from the scene, right? So, um, but uh, I just wonder how long that can be sustained. Yeah, um, uh, for a while, right? I think that he has good allies in in folks like China, right? Um, Although China has not been willing to, you know, give military assistance, sell weaponry, things like that. Um, they certainly are quick to prop up the Russian economy, which right. certainly helps right. Putin directly, right? Um, so the sanctions that Biden is about to levy for uh, Navalny, who you just uh, alluded to, uh, the the opposition leader who has been in prison for the last three years, um, who suspiciously died of, quote, uh, natural causes, unquote, uh, earlier this week, um, we're going to levy sanctions against Russia. And again, you know, when we do that in the globalized, intertwined market, it, it, you know, you have these authoritarian leaders um, and it tends to just trickle down to the the working middle class. uh, Two things about sanctions. Number one, you're exactly right. They almost always impact the people at the bottom end of the the, uh, the power structure and uh, and and economy. Uh, Number two, they almost never convince whoever they're levied against to change their ways. Absolutely not, no. Uh, And so, but they're symbolic. Especially Putin. Right. And, and they're symbolic and they can make it look like whoever's loving them is doing something yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, yeah, they're almost never effective. I mean, no. You look at we've sanctioned Iran. We've sanctioned Cuba. We, it, 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 they go they on. Continue, they go on. <laughs> right. right? And, and, and so maybe maybe at some point we need to reevaluate if there's a better way of, of doing something. Right. But, um, but I, you know, the other thing that I think. Putin is hoping for here is that the U.S. especially, uh, and you're seeing this in in some Republican circles for sure in Congress, um, uh, the U.S. getting tired of sending Ukraine money to support oh, yeah. them and oh, equipment absolutely. and such, yeah. right? And that right. they will just get, okay, we, we're done with this. We, we did what we could. Right. And he's trying to hold out yeah. and say, can I have more patience than they do? Well, that's why you try, why you tie, I'm sorry, uh, Israeli funding to Ukrainian right. funding at this point, right? Because there is a deep distaste, particularly within the Republican Party at this point, um, for continuing right. um, funding, particularly as the presidential nominee knee, uh, right, the uh, heir apparent, yeah. Trump, um, you know, continues to sort of uh, allude to his closeness with Putin. Affinity, yes, for, there maybe, someone might say, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, well, and then you had, uh, we probably should mention. Some elections. At least, uh, well, before we get to oh, that, sorry, but yeah. more about, about Russia. Oh, what? Uh, well, you had Tucker Carlson go do this oh, interview. Uh, and You do this one. Uh, and <laughs> this was the most absurd thing I have observed in a long time, uh, you want to be a journalist and you want to go interview Putin, fine. Um, but this was like, hey, give us, I'm going to give you free reign to justify everything you're doing, right? And then he goes off and he's like, oh, look at these wonderful grocery stores and look at the wonderful subway. And I'm like, well, look at the people that they had to crush exactly. to make that happen, right? right? And it's like- I, I thought you liked capitalism, Tucker. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> I, this is never. I have never seen a um, a, a party like the Republican Party uh, of the last four or five years yeah. so abandon uh, uh, long held positions on Russia and or, or any other thing, right? And just like, oh, we're just going to embrace this yeah. authoritarian uh, because, and I can't figure out why, uh, yeah. I, what benefit is there to doing that? Do you remember whenever Barack Obama laughed, like openly chuckled at Mitt Romney, whenever he said that Russia was the greatest threat yeah. to the United States in the 21st I century do, in right? that debate? I do. And here we sit. And, 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 and Romney kind of, it took a long time, it took, but it kind of proved true that to be correct, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, and so... Uh, but how far have this, the Republican Party went 
That's and, and delete, I mean, yeah, just it's this just is not insane. Reagan's party. I mean, it imagine tear down oh this my, wall, Reagan. Oh my that's goodness, this no, party? right? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, you know, now the party would say, we'll help you build the wall, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and Mexico will pay for it? Right, Question something mark? like that. I don't know, you know. All right, Sorry, that's enough about Russia. Yourself. But I just found that whole episode absurd. And uh, and why anybody would treat that yeah. legitimately, I don't know. Right. right. But apparently there's a big audience for some of that somewhere. Yeah, no doubt. So speaking of Russia, just really quickly. Uh, the AP uh, has put out and uh, other uh, outlets that I adore, like Foreign Affairs also uh, have put out World Politics Review, um, different uh, elections that are going on in the international community uh, over the course of this year that will have uh, an impact uh, on global relationships and, and foreign policy. Um, Pakistan has already happened and we're already seeing the, the kind of fallout. Uh, from that, it looks like uh, the government is likely to turn in a much more rightward um, or right weaning, right weaning. I just made a word leaning uh, <laughs> uh, position. Um, Belarus is another one uh, that's upcoming. Uh, Azerbaijan also just had one. So uh, obviously, you've got Putin's influence in both of those places. Um, Slovakia as well. Uh, India uh, is expected uh, in April or May. Certainly, Modi uh, should he you know leave office, which is unlikely uh, at this point point, that would be very interesting. Um, the European Union has, uh, over the summer, uh, their elections as well. Uh, and then, of course, the United States. Uh, so there are a, a host of different things. Mexico in June, uh, that obviously has an implication uh, on the United States, depending on, you know, who gets into office uh, and how they work with the cartels um, and, and violence that tends to have an, an influence and certainly an impact on our, our southern border. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of Lots of things going on in the international community. Uh, I've got my comparative kids doing a global <laughs> election analysis because one, that's what one does. One election that uh, that we w just found very interesting and in yeah. the parallels to what could play out to the U.S. is uh, Pakistan yeah. just had a recent election right. that was you had the person who won the election, I think, was in, in prison, prison at the yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, and now my understanding is that some of that was political very, kind of yeah. persecution or whatnot, but but it was a very interesting dynamic to play out. And it kind of threw, apparently the the ruling party was not expecting that outcome at no, all. And, no. and so I, I've just found that very, very interesting. I'm like, hmm, I wonder where else that could play yeah. out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see. We will see what, uh, what occurs. All right. Um, let's come back. Yeah. Local for a yes, second. Yes, please. Right? All right. So, I heard you um, had something to say. Well, you know, I've been very good the last couple of episodes You've without, been, yes. uh, without ranting. I'm going to try not to rant too much, but I've got a couple of things I want to say. So we just had, we're within a couple of days of a horrible tragedy up in Owasso where uh, a, a young person uh, was in a, a fight at school. The next day they passed away. They died, right? And... Uh, this was a a, a a person who identified as non-binary, right? Yep. Uh, and uh, and so this comes out, and there's all sorts of speculation about what happened, right? And initial news stories, uh, they were in this massive fight. Uh, they got beat up. There was speculation it was related to they they beat this person up. Uh, next uh, last name Benedict. Benedict, right? Next Benedict, they 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 beat this person up, uh, and they subsequently passed away because of the injuries from that. Now we had a, a medical report that came out from the uh, the per people doing the autopsy, the yeah. medical examiners, yeah. who said uh, their death was not related to trauma from that fight. Right. right? Uh, so we still don't know what caused the death. Right. Uh, so. My first partial, not much of a rant, but it's like, could we not be speculating on this right now? We know a few basic facts. This person went into a restroom, mm -hmm. was attacked by some other students. Right. Um, uh, the school, how they handled that could be very questionable in my opinion. Uh, uh, but my understanding is the person who was attacked was suspended. The people who attacked next 
were were already in suspension. Right. They had been were being disciplined, yes. uh, and uh, and so Nexus' grandmother comes, picks them up, mm-hmm. takes them home, uh, and then subsequently the next day they uh, go to the the hospital and Nex passes away. Correct, right? right? And that's the extent of what we know. Right. And I would like for people to not jump to some conclusions right now until we know more. Uh, My concern is the police and the school need to be totally transparent in this discussion uh, because um, uh, it will just undermine faith in those institutions, which we already have a lot of undermining going on. They need to be entirely transparent about this, this process, right? Uh, It could be the speculation is this was some sort of hate crime, But we don't know that yet. Uh, and I just want to to say, let's let the police do their work. Let's hold the police accountable for doing what they're supposed to do. Let's hold the school accountable, too. And that's where my more rantish thing is going to go. Yeah. Because how, whatever comes out of this, this is another episode of violence in our public schools. Yes. And uh, and this is this is something that I think too many people are trying to sweep under the rug is the amount of violence. When you look at we've had school teachers who've been arrested and, and, and thrown into prison, coaches yeah. um, uh, because of violence they committed against others. Uh, we have uh, the same thing going on with uh, sexual violence or uh, such that they've done. Uh, and when I talk to teachers and I know a lot of people think, well, you, do, you just don't know what's going on because I don't. I didn't have kids in public school. I have lots of friends yeah. who teach. Uh, I have family members who teach in you Oklahoma teach public schools. In public uh, school. I know what um, I know what's going on. Right. And when I talk to them about the most important issues that they're dealing with, you know what they always come back to me is: we can't control our classrooms. Sure. We cannot effectively remove people who are disruptive to the learning environment or even dangerous to themselves or other students. Sure. Uh, and uh, and until we address that issue, right. we're going to continue to have these problems. And I am more agitated about another example of violence yeah. that occurred, right? Uh, and, uh, and not addressing, why are we not addressing that? Right. Because that is an issue that continues to come up. Uh, and uh, and we have uh, schools who, who downplay it. We have organizations. They don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about other stuff. Uh, and the first thing that I want, if I have my student in a, in, in a school, I want to know they're going to be safe. Yeah. And uh, and if, if I'm a parent uh, who has a child in a school and I don't think they're safe, get them out of there. There's lots of options now and, and, and get them out. But I am really, really concerned that um, uh, that we're not taking the level of violence that has been occurring more seriously. And this is just one more very egregious example of that. Yeah. I mean, so if the the so it was a three on one, according uh-huh. to uh, text messages, right. right? Text message right. screenshots from Nexus phone. Um, and so, yeah, if, if the three people who jumped next in the bathroom were already probably in school suspension is what I would assume that's, if they were in. That's my assumption right? as well. And so, yeah, why are they in school? What is in school suspension and how does that play out? And, and why, why are, are they, they allowed together? to congregate yes, exactly. in a bathroom? Right, that with, part. My, yeah, uh, what I exactly. read was that the teacher was on the outside mm-hmm. of the bathroom. Uh, and and why would that teacher allow next to go in there right. with people who are already known Obviously, for getting into trouble. Entities, yeah, just right? generally speaking, yeah. Uh, none of this makes sense to me. Right. Uh, and I'm really, really aggravated that we're not taking that more seriously. And I think there's a another level within the school as well. I'm going to add to his rant, perhaps, um, where the, the you know the school nurse looked at all of them mm-hmm. um, and just said that nobody needed you know medical treatment, things like that. And so that's another kind of level of accountability, depending on how right the medical examiner's report right. that's you right. know comes out. Yeah. That I mean, uh, man, if, the liability if, there is. If the injuries are much more serious. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, early reports right. often are not the most accurate because people are just trying to get as much information out as possible for what's being said. Uh, but 
There were some reports that indicated that Nex was having trouble just walking out of the school, had to be assisted. And so uh, we need to know all of this stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we need to know exactly how this transpired, why it transpired. And, and, uh, and then we need to take action. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I think I'm just, I feel so bad for Nexus family yeah. that this occurred. I feel very bad for other students who might be in that school having similar types of problems. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and uh, school officials, law enforcement, Folks, if folks at the legislature want to do something productive, yeah. here's something they they could do: yeah. is find a way to address this kind of violence. Uh, but uh, but I, it, it, what happened isn't just a tragedy. It, in my turn viewpoint, it's a travesty that that would have ever occurred in yeah. the first place. I mean, and coming off the heels of what happened in Mustang, right? You had the uh, one student who committed suicide and I believe another who um, committed self-harm in that actual bathroom at right. the high school. Right. Um, and so again, I mean, this is this is clearly a problem yeah. um, within our public school systems. So, and, and we need to be thinking about how to deal with it. Yeah. So that's Agreed. that's my rant for the day. I agree. Uh, and... Uh, and I think uh, we need to we need to put pressure. I want full transparency for both the school and law enforcement uh, uh, on this because we need to know exactly what happened, and then we need to everybody needs to come together and say how likely is that though? Do? I don't know. With the I, don't I mean, know. being know, a minor situation, uh, it, you know what I mean? Obviously, not a, not a you know what I mean? A, right. a, a situation involving a minor, I should right? Say. Obviously, and what I've seen in the past is. Uh, the, the law enforcement issuing, uh, making public uh, reports and such, but, uh, you know, uh, blacking out names or in, inserting subject A for a student's name or something because they are dealing with minors, right? right? Yeah. Uh, but I'm more concerned about the adults in the room, yeah. so to speak. How, what yeah. did they do and, and how did they behave right. uh, in, in all of this and, and how – how did we allow a situation like this to occur in the first place? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got some information, some interesting information on Gen Z, and we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, uh, and I think it'll likely lead. We, we you know, discuss perhaps uh, having some young folks on uh, to discuss their attitudes. I, I think it would be uh, interesting to stack up Oklahoma's Gen Z versus, uh, you know, the national sure. uh, polling that we right. have here yeah. uh, specifically. But uh, yeah, we are constantly talking about our, our generational uh, differences um, or, you know, similarities as <laughs> they may be. Um, yeah, this research is really interesting. So where do we find this? You, you this actually brought this the, to me. Uh, let me uh, make sure. PR RRI, which is, I think, the public, uh, let me go back here and I'll pull this up, the Public Religion Research Institute. So that's who conducted this, this information, this, this survey uh, and this research, um, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Very. Um, so, yeah, they consider uh, what what such Gen Z effectively apart um, from the other generations, which uh, in uh, many of the cases, they are drastically different. Uh, but in other places, it, it seems like Gen Z and millennials are, are very much amalgamated almost. And, and there seems to be even within Gen Z a little bit of a divide. Yeah. Right? Younger yeah, Gen Z's. Now, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that because uh, – you know, if you're talking about minors, uh, you know, teenagers that right. I th apparently they tried to survey as well. Um, I just think, well, uh, maybe some of that difference is just related to being at home, being with your parents and parental right. influence. Right. right? So right. Uh, what will be interesting to see is do they become more like these older millenn mm -hmm. these older Gen Z folks? Right. Um uh, as they age into, right, get past 18 and such. Right. So I guess we should mention, so this is, um, this report is based on both results of a national survey of all Americans, which include oversamples uh, of Gen Z. So you mentioned uh, adults, so that's ages 18 to 25. Uh, and again, they did try to uh, also survey Gen Z teens 13 to 17, right. uh, as well as uh, focus groups. They did virtual focus groups um, across the spectrum. 
spectrum in terms of Gen Z adults and, and the age ranges. So um, really interesting, the the results. Where do you want to where do you want to start? Well, I, a couple of things that stood out to me yeah. was uh, kind of the party breakdown. So yeah. Gen Z is less likely to be Republican yeah. uh, than uh, other uh, other uh, generational cohorts. Uh but it's not like they're rushing to be Democrats right. either, right? So a majority of Gen Z's, 51%, yeah. so they don't even identify with either of the major parties. That's a problem, right? right? Yeah. Um, that's a huge problem going forward. And I constantly, I'm sure on here, I've ranted about it. I do in my classes. Uh, you know, the identity crisis within both of your major political parties um, where, you know, a majority of adults, uh, 43% or so, uh, are identifying as independents. When you have this much uh, of the electorate, right, the, the upcoming electorate sure. who don't identify with either of the two major parties, uh, um, man, you know your third party or multi party systems start looking real good. If a, if a part, a third that's party dangerous. can figure out how to to grab hold of fifty one percent, that's dangerous that's, for those two parties. It does not speak well for for those parties, right? Uh, the other thing I found interesting was that uh, again, the split. Uh, so. Uh, Gen Z adults, mm -hmm. uh, so those over eighteen, mm -hmm. tend to be a little bit more liberal than yes. Gen Z teens. Uh, again, I'm wondering how much this is parental yeah, influence. I I, I'd agree. like to see if they could come back and 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 do the same kind of research with those those teens when they're over 18, mm -hmm. whether that would change or whether you'd still see a split there. Right. right. That would be interesting to see. Uh, same thing. Uh, Gen Z teens tended to be. Uh, well, what they said was they tended to attend church more yeah. than uh, Gen Z adults. Again, uh, if your parents are taking you to church, that might be right. Part of that. Yeah, I think that the church attendance, that is always uh, kind of of interest to me, right? The millennial generation gets blamed a lot uh, for, of course, being amoral and a-religious, etc. Um, it's true. My generation did kind of start the the, the decline, if you will, uh, in steady religious attendance and, uh, you know, kind of fervent beliefs. In fact, I went uh, to Pew, Pew Research Studies. They do the Religious Attitude right. Survey. Uh, and so in terms of attendance, uh, young millennials uh, tend to visit uh, church or, or attend, they say, a, a church once a week at uh, 28% versus older millennials at 27% uh, and 38% uh, for boomers, which I th would have thought would have been much higher than that. I would have thought that. so too, but yeah, right? That's most recent reporting uh, Interesting. from Pew. Uh, so yeah, I I think that the religiously unaffiliated-ness uh, uh, of Gen Z it, you know, I, I, is interesting and maybe plays I'm out in politics a little bit. Well, I'm wondering how much is that is a response to the politicization of religion, yeah. right? And, and where you have uh, churches today that seem to want to align politically with one group or another. Right. Uh, and uh, that, that doesn't seem to be something that has uh, attracted more adherence to those churches, right? right. Uh, uh, and so I'm wondering how much of that might play into this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I have, I'd like to see more research on that. But uh, if if they're seeing churches which are supposed to not be just about politics, yeah. if, if they're yeah. seeing politics continuously being yeah. preached or, or talked about in those churches, it might just turn them off. And they're they're having the same reaction to those churches now that they are having to the party. Exactly. Right? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um what I really liked, and we also have another poll uh, from Business Insider, and uh, the source was the Survey Center on uh, American Life. So uh, young women, Gen Z women, are substantially more liberal uh, than Gen Z men, 47% women uh, to 38% men. Uh, and young women also are more concerned about major issues, according to this Business Insider right. um, poll. So the, the share of Americans between 18 to 29 uh, who say that these things are a problem. Uh, things like uh, gun violence, 46% uh, of men say uh, it's an issue versus 65% uh, of young women. Uh, you have to go all the way down uh, to affordability of college education to get 
anywhere near uh, the same level of concern. And it's 48 percent men uh, and 49 percent young women, um, which I guess is a good thing. Right. So the economics of college is something that is of of concern. Right. We probably would not be as, uh, you know, evenly split if we were talking about in the 1950s, obviously, because not as many women would be going to college and concerned. Um, But it is very interesting to see, you know, the host of issues um, that that. I'm, I'm not even sure that young men are at all interested in it. Like the gauge of the survey. Um, are they interested in anything, James? You're raising uh, a few of them. What's what's uh, happening here? Uh, video games. Is that what it is? They are. I, but I don't, neither of my sons are super political. Right. Right. Neither of them. Which have is so strong, funny because the, look at the tree, I, man. Well, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but there is this increasingly divide, especially between Gen Z males and females mm-hmm. of, uh, both what they consider important, mm-hmm. how, how they view politics. Uh, something I found was interesting in this report as well. And I've seen this in other places also, uh, that, uh, Gen Z females, mm-hmm. Uh, and especially Gen Z Democrat females mm-hmm. have a little bit higher um, uh, rate of uh, despondency, of um, uh, depression, oh, yes. of those yeah, kinds of things, really right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I I thought, okay, well, what's what's going on here? Mm-hmm. Uh, so That's cool. uh, social they're, media, sir. They're, well, and I think <laughs> right, we we uh, we both are probably familiar with. Uh, uh, Jonathan Haidt, another in Haidt, uh, another uh, person that that I think we both have read, is just on a rampage about social media's negative impacts on on young people. Uh, and while it is on both males and females, uh, it seems to affect females more. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So uh, Gen Z is dealing with stuff that. I never had to deal with growing up. Well, you know, I mean, uh, those body uh, but, <laughs> types of issues, those those things have always been there for young women. They just manifest themselves uh, in a much more visceral way uh, via social media. Well, I one think. thing I thought was pretty f- interesting and good news for Gen Z folks, which is most people don't think that they're too lazy to get a job or so, right. You know, I thought that was that was. Listen, I re- I'm old enough to remember. People in my parents' generation, and all oh, those kids, they just too late. They not well, won't work hard. Yes. I yes, know me. people in my generation mm-hmm. have said that about yes. others. You my know, they're just, a, yes. uh, they're just. I think that's just a classic <laughs> old person thing, is that what it right? Is, yeah. is uh, that that uh, whoever the young people are, they're lazier they're lazy, than they should be, right? right? Uh, but apparently, we, that's not how we view Gen Zers, right? So that's that's pretty good. That is good, um, and. I'm not really sure about uh, the, the this college education uh, as an investment. Okay, so that one worries me. So they're not too lazy to work, right. but but they're not interested in going to college. Which, uh, and here's here's the thing. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, I, I'm going to try not to go no, on another please rant. Don't do but, statistics. But, please. No, but I'm just going to say not rapid fire. It's still true that. Um, Going to college is a, a, a you're going to have lifetime earnings much higher than yes. someone who doesn't, Absolutely. right? That is still true. We've got the data to degree. show that. Yes. Um, uh, yes. If you have a bachelor's degree, you're significantly less likely to end up in poverty during your lifetime. Um, uh, so there are still good things. Now, having said that, I think we have to acknowledge not all degrees are created equal, right? Some produce better end result. If what you're wanting from your college education is some measure of financial security, different degrees will provide that in right. different amounts, yeah, right? right. Uh, and so uh, I think young people should be made to understand that mm-hmm. um, and help in identifying, right? right. And, and I have um, five kids, Three of them have been to college. Uh, my youngest just started again this. The other two are going a different way. But right. what they understand is if you go a different way, if you don't want to be susceptible to some of these economic downturns mm-hmm. and whatnot, you better have a skill right. that people want, want. Exactly. right? You better have a, the ability to do something 
that is in demand uh, in the economy, mm-hmm. or else you're just going to be at the winds of whatever's going on, yeah, right? Exactly. You you have to, and that, by the way, that's a part of education. It's training. We we always consider training a little bit different than education, mm-hmm. but at, at the end of the day, it's building knowledge and skills, it's workforce you, development, something like that, right? Right. Uh, so. I, it is a little yeah. concerning that they do that. I think there's a lot of, of of the politics going on that is is undermining that. And you have, you know, um, we're in a red state, so you right. have a lot more skepticism of higher education yes. in in our state. Uh, uh, although I think in in some blue states they don't take criticisms of higher ed as as seriously as they should. So. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I think that is concerning in that the, such a large proportion of them don't think college is a good investment yeah. because all the data we have says it is. It is, right. Um, another one that I found interesting, um, al- although 43% of Americans agree with the statement, we won't be able to solve the country's problems, big problems, uh, until the older generation is no longer in power, right? Uh, 58% of Gen Z adults uh, and 54% of millennials agree. Um, Even though they say that in an overwhelming uh, amount, um, Uh why are you not running for office? Why are better yet? Why are you not voting? But then, you know, let me ask the deeper, why are you not running for office? If if you think what is needed is new ideas, fresh ideas, why, younger ideas. Why are you waiting for what, these what octogenarians? I don't right. understand. And, and, and let's look. I, I think this is a trend. We've talked about this multiple times before. Yeah. You've got these two 78, 81 year olds running for president. Yeah. Well, here's the thing as lifespans continue to increase mm-hmm. uh, and people are f- more physically healthy in these older ages. Right. Some of them are just not going to want to stop working. Right. 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 Uh, and so we're going to see some of that uh, emerge. But, yeah, I mean, th- these these younger folks need to realize you, waiting around for your turn doesn't always pan out the way you think you, <laughs> it would. Right. right? And, and get active. Do something. Right. Similarly, uh, 58 percent of Gen Z uh, adults and 60 percent uh, of millennials believe that voting is the most effective way to create uh, change in America uh, compared to your generation. Gen X are 70 percent and 80 uh, percent of boomers. I think they're more right is. than the older generation. I don't think right. voting is always the way. Right. I, you know, there's a whole lot you can do. You, yeah, in your community, right. in in your state, there's stuff you can do beyond voting okay. that is extremely meaningful and can have really positive impacts on your community. Agree, uh, but, but I still I like you to grow. <laughs> I, I would still would like you to vote. Thank you, you should vote as right. well, right? Yes, thank uh, you. And, and, and quite frankly, if you're doing that stuff, my argument is always: if you're doing that stuff, that work. That vote becomes a lot more meaningful informed, to you. Yeah, right? It becomes exactly. more informed, but it becomes more meaningful yeah, because fair. you are engaged you, with your community yeah, and, and you're trying to make a difference. Yeah. And that vote is just one more extension of that desire to make my community, my state, my country a better place to live. Yeah. Right. I agree. So query me this one. Um, I really liked. So number one, um, the one on affirmative action. So okay. uh, most Americans, 63 percent believe that programs geared towards helping poor students or students of color uh, get admission. So affirmative action yeah. uh, to selective or prestigious colleges are affecting, I'm sorry, effective uh, in prepping young people for the future. So that's all Americans, 63 right. percent. Uh, and that includes a majority of Gen Z adults, 69 percent, uh, as well as Gen Z teens, 65 percent. Uh-huh. Uh, and as we know, on June 29th last year, last summer, um, the Supreme Court reversed affirmative action in colleges and university uh, admissions processes, um, even though a majority of the folks who are attending those, I mean, matriculating uh, and, and about to enter those places, um, believe that it should still be a criteria or, or part of the the admissions process. So right. I think we're, you, we're having a whole bunch of we balance uh, discussions that? of of how is it that you open up access mm-hmm. to people? And, and what we're really talking about are people who historically have been denied right. access to higher education, right? right? Uh, uh, and I think we're at this place is what's the most effective way of doing that? We right. saw during the pandemic 
this trend of schools saying, well, we're not going to use SATs. As, Which uh, Yale, now, and now, yeah, right? Na- like, Yale just announced, reversed, Dartmouth yeah. just announced yep. that, yep. Uh, you know what we learned? We, we learned are. that, that d- not using those actually hurts those, those students that we were wanting to help, yep. right? Yep. Uh, and so uh, I think everybody's trying to struggle with what's the best way of doing this. Right. I saw a really interesting uh, uh, take on this the other day which was this person suggested what what a, a university should do is have a minimum floor of, of you know, some kind of standardized test. Uh, and then everybody who applies, they just they just randomly select from that group that applies. Uh, and and they said the minimum floor ensures that, OK, you know, they're going to be able to do the work. work yeah. But then the random selection just says whoever it is, it's a, right. kind of a, like every, a lottery. Every fifth person, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that would be any more effective than what we do. But I think it's important to recognize in Oklahoma, I keep going back when people are, you know, I hear lots of conservatives complaining about affirmative action or or, or these programs. And I think we have a history of denying people access, right? We have two major cases, um, Sipowell and McLaurin, that both Mm -hmm. broke down obstacles to minorities having access to higher education in Oklahoma, Uh, And so we need to take that seriously. Uh, Have other things maybe went awry in some places? Sure. But on this basic question of should we try as much as possible to help people who in the past did not have that avenue, should we help them acquire that avenue, have access to that, right? Uh, And I think that's what you're seeing here. I think within that broad framework, uh, there's also, I think, I would like to see schools be able to experiment with whatever, whatever. way they think yeah, would, would exactly. be yeah. the best way of doing right. that, right? Uh, how do you think creating a more diverse population of students uh, in a, a variety of, of ways of defining diverse, right? right? How, um, how can you do that while ensuring that the students that you graduate can actually do the work that you're saying that they can do, right? Uh, and I just don't like, you know me, I'm a libertarian. I don't like top down driven. You if you want to do it, you have to do it this way. Everything should be open for discussion. Yeah, I agree with you. This is again, where we meet kind of in the, uh, at the ends of things. I do think it is interesting. And, you know, the Supreme court just, uh, declined to hear a case. In fact, defining further, um, their ruling on affirmative action. And so they're kind of doing, taking your approach on that. Right. And what I found interesting was this was actually rela- related to a high school, yes. right? Yeah. An elite high school, mm-hmm. kind of a college preparatory kind of, right. of place. But yeah, they said, we've said what we said. We're done. Yeah, we're done <laughs> with this for now. Yeah. Um, Which was very interesting that, mm-hmm. that, that they said, Let, let's, and I would love for courts and governments uh, in other places, just give people some breathing room yeah. to try to figure, figure this out. out. Yeah. And don't think that you have to impose some kind of, standardized one size fits all all solution Uh, let some people play around and figure right. it out. They're going to have to. Uh, Gen Z is the most most ethnically diverse sure. uh, generation that we have ever encountered. Yeah. Um, and so I mean this is this is something that we're going to have to figure out as a society, as universities, as you know just generally speaking. That's right. Uh, and so, I yeah. think that's going to be an expectation that yeah. Gen Z has is that. Uh, that w- we don't put up barriers mm-hmm. to diverse diversity on our college campuses or in our workplaces, right. that kind of thing, right? Uh, and and the question is always, how do we balance wanting that diversity with other priorities that we right. have, right? right. It, it can't be the only because consideration. Merit offered, right, merit is still, right. Yeah, I, I know, am still I, very much in favor of I, I me like, deserving <laughs> that position, not just because I'm a, you That's know, right. And, and that's why I think, you know, that's where I think those standardized tests come in, right? right? Is Although they, I'm horrible at standardized tests. Well, I was not great <laughs> either, so I'm right there with you. Um, but um, an interesting take on this that, that I have, kind of looked at is, is merit is really much more difficult to identify than we think sometimes. That's fair. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, And, and I was listening to a, uh, a, an economist from Harvard uh, who was born to a, you know, a single mom Mm -hmm. and grew up and eventually was able to get into Harvard and such. Uh, But one of the things he made, he talked about, and I've heard some others talk about it this way was, you know, let's say you have a student, um, who has lower test scores, maybe slightly lower grades, 
but you look at where they came from. Right. And then you compare that to a student who has had every advantage mm-hmm. possible in life. Yeah. Uh, who is more meritorious in right. that that situation, right? And I think those are important questions to grapple right. with. Yeah. Is it's not just what your grades were, and and but you have to take into context if you're talking about who might have the potential to go on and do really great things. Right. What have they overcome to just get to where they are? Right. Has to be part of that that yeah. conversation. I agree with that. Uh, and, and 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 that that throws a whole other wrench into how do we ensure that we have this kind of uh, diversity, right? Socioeconomic diversity, racial diversity, all of that that we're looking for, political diversity, Religious. all of how do we yeah. ensure that that is emerging largely organically, right? right. It, it's it's That's really smart. weird yeah. is when it's Forced on you, yeah. but it, but but I think especially with Gen Z, they're going to see this kind of organic kind of mm-hmm. diversity emerge because they're just so diverse themselves, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, I see it in you know the debate groups that I have. My kids do; they write a paper and they take the Pew Ideology Survey, sure. and so I put them in like-minded groups, and we have an actual debate day where they come and you know with their research, etc. Um, and you do you just kind of see the um, you know the diversity, right? The, the the young Republicans are completely <laughs> different, right? Uh, and and a, an eclectic bunch versus you know the liberals versus the sure. independents, and so it's it's refreshing and lovely to see, right? Um, that it's not just this homogenous group of uh, you know liberals or right. or conservatives or and, whatever it is. And I think that that is what's important is uh, whether you're talking about political ideology or party, you know, every group spans the range, yeah. right? There, we know we know some groups tend to align with certain parties more than others, but the fact is we should, and I think Gen Z's generation is really going to bring this th- yeah. this home, is you can't assume because I am X mm-hmm. that I believe this way about exactly. politics or something, yeah. right? I think that's going to go away that's pretty That's why quickly. the party system is so, so in trouble. Right. Um, and, right. and why I continue to kind of poke at this its very flimsy structure with these kids. They don't identify. They continue to get the lesser of two evils in every election from both parties. Something has to change. If, whether it's the way that we conduct elections, if we need to go to, you know, a different type of primary or runoff or rank choice, whatever it, it it is, something has to give within uh, the situation. I, again, think that both of your parties are having identity crises and have no oh, idea who their yeah. bases are absolutely. at this point, especially when you have 51 percent of these young kids who don't align with either of them. So. Uh, we're waiting, right? There's a pool of human beings out here in the electorate who are waiting for their super gotcha. person, their party, somebody to pull, you know, people together and, and unify them around some sort of ideology or values that matter to this this generation. That's right. That's what we're That's missing right. here. And uh, and as the and it's parties- not Vivek Ramaswamy. Sorry, <laughs> I had to. Sorry, it is not you, sir. Stop <laughs> rapping Eminem. Well, and, and what will be interesting to see who does emerge yeah. that that can attract these these young people yeah. to to them, right? What kinds of issues are they going to gravitate to, mm-hmm. uh, and and how is someone going to speak to them in a way that says we think that's the right way to solve this right. problem, right? Yeah. Uh, but the two major parties are really struggling. Uh, uh, it would be great, you know, maybe this election cycle will be the f- the first real step to to breaking their kind of hold on our electoral process. We'll see. Um, I don't have any don't hope that, so. a, that a, well, I don't have any hope that a third party candidate would either. win. or yeah. an, But if they gain a sizable share, mm-hmm. uh, if if you saw what I'm waiting for is a, a third party or independent candidate that actually wins some electoral mm-hmm. votes, sure. right? Sure. Then you know you've got something that it's really it's at play. Yeah. And if those two parties, if the Republicans and Democrats want to stay uh, relevant, mm-hmm. they're going to have to change some yeah. of the ways they're approaching things, right? Yeah. Lord. Lots of good stuff, though. Yeah. Uh, and these youngsters, they're, you know, uh, they're, all right. they're all right. They're all right. They're going to be they're, okay. They, they will be just <laughs> fine, right? Uh, it, it, it is just true. And I, I kid around a lot about, you know, always being the grumpy old man in uh-huh. the room. Shaking his fist at but the I sky. But I am super optimistic. Uh, the, that you the, are. At the, uh, the end of the day, I think things are going to work out. Uh, I told a group of students not too long ago, uh, like, I believe we are on the cusp of overcoming a whole bunch of challenges. 
And my concern, is, my biggest concern is that our politics will cut off the, that accomplishment, right? Yeah. I uh, That's my biggest concern. I think we are on the cusp of figuring out how to deal effectively with environmental issues. I think we're on the cusp of, of uh, figuring out what to do about poverty. I think we're on the cusp of, of, of all of these things. We're going to see some cures to things that have plagued us for a long time, yeah. cancer. In the next 50 years or so, I think that stuff is going to come down the pike if we don't allow the the, the craziness of our politics to undermine that progress. And uh, But I am still extremely optimistic. So, I love that about you, sir. Uh, and I, I, I want to encourage these, every, every time I get to be in front of a group of young people, I, the world is yours. That's it, right. you, these folks, That's right. they have never, there's never been a generation that has had the opportunities mm-hmm. that this generation will have. change. And, and, and they need to ways. grab hold of that and run with it, yep. right? Okay. And, and don't let us old Gen Xers or, or even older folks get in the way, right? right? Yay. We love that. Yeah. That's a fantastic I mean, way to end. No, don't say anymore. <laughs> that was, that was great. All right. Well then I think we'll wrap up right there. Fantastic. Right? Good conversation. Next week, I'm going to tease our, our yes, next, next program. We've got uh, Jonathan Rauch uh, from the Brookings Institute. Yes. And, and I, we we consider Jonathan a friend. Uh, he uh, he came to Rose State a couple of years ago. Uh, and we've been trying to find a way to get connect back with him. Uh, he's going to be on the program talking about an article he wrote recently in The Atlantic. We'll probably talk a little politics with oh, him as yeah. well. Uh, maybe a little bit about higher ed. He's written some stuff on higher ed uh, and some of the challenges that it faces also. Uh, but uh, we are super excited uh, to have him on the show. Yes, very. We are. Yeah. All right. Well, don't forget. Democracy is not a spectator sport. We'll see you next time. We love communication that goes both ways, not just you listening to us pontificate. We would love to hear from our audience. If you have comments, suggestions, or would like to contact us about possibly being a guest on the show, please email notmygeneration at raider.rose.edu.